thank everybody for coming out. It's good to see so many uh, faces on a cold day like today. Hopefully getting here wasn't too bad. I know that there was a few hiccups with the parking in the garage uh, under the James Center deck, so hopefully everybody was able to navigate okay. Uh, today we have with us John Cole Scott. Um, he is the President and Chief Investment Officer at Closed End Fund Advisors. Um, and he's been with that firm since 2001. In 2008, John founded CEFdata.com, a data service now covering all listed and non-listed closed-end funds, business development companies, and interval funds. Uh, John is also the founder and executive chairman of the Active Investment Company Alliance, serves as the treasurer and on the investment committee for the New York State Society of the Cincinnati was a past board member of the Richmond Association for Business Economics, and he is a past treasurer and chair of the Finance and Investment Committee for William & Mary National Alumni Board. Um, he is a fellow graduate of the College of William & Mary, and he holds the cert Certified Funds Specialist designation, uh, and he's a licensed Series 66 through FINRA. Um, I've known John for a while. He's a <coughs> very... Uh, Data, he's a data junkie like me, and um, I think what he's going to say today has uh, a, lot of, a lot of good content. So, without further ado. Was anyone here 12 years ago when I last spoke? <laughs> well, good. It's a lot different. We have a lot more data coverage than we had before. Um, my goal is to cover close and fund with the lens towards activism. I also hope to have time to do a light coverage of business development companies, which I feel had, could use uh, more focus for institutional investment in the space, better returns, some interesting liquid options there by our definition. And let me straighten my tie out for the video. Uh, but with that, um, we'll get going. We have a quarterly presentation tomorrow covering everything, 60 data slides over twice the length. If you don't get enough today, Feel free to log in tomorrow at 2 p.m. at cefadvisors.com, front slash quarterly. We're an investment management firm. We're founded in Santa Barbara. My father bought it in, in distress in 1996. We focus on separately managed accounts in a highly customized way. I call them model portfolios, but pretty much all of our client accounts are unique. Our dispersions are very, very high, even in the same style of management because of the individual nature of our clients. I developed the data service originally with a partnership with a group called Fundamental Data, which maybe the folks um, at 1607 and um, uh, the like previous firm might recognize, which was sold to Morningstar in 08. Thankfully, they didn't water down and break it till 11 when we started self-sourcing data. Um, talked to Lewis Aaron, the founder of that previous firm, and really started to build what we can collect and offer in a high quality way. We now cover every closed-ended management company the oldest and best known are regular US listed close end funds. That does include interval funds, which look and feel like an, an open end fund, but you can't redeem them daily, generally for private equity and private credit. We offer data in lots of different ways. You can definitely ask me about that if you have interest. And we do some consulting and work for fund sponsors and hedge funds and, and service providers. Uh, we have a UIT in the BDC space. That revenue really powered our BDC coverage in 2014. And like I said, a link to our quarterly. I, I joke without a boss, I get bored at work. And I'm being treasurer of two nonprofits. I, did, I felt a lack of quality content in my industry. So in summer of 2019, I set one up, not knowing what the heck we're in for the following year. I can argue COVID both almost killed us, but then made us. Because it acquired nimbleness in and, uh, and, and a way that you had to be nimble to do. And we do a weekly podcast that covers the industry as well. A closed-end fund is a... Common stock, except for it's under the 40 Act currently. It's a fixed pool of capital, so we say a stable share account if you're not familiar with it. It can change through rights offerings, tenders, dividend reinvestments, but generally a fixed pool of capital, which lends itself to less liquid investments. In the 90s, when my dad was writing this book, it was uh, you know, focused on international investing before ETFs really could access there. Currently, a lot more you know, illiquid credits, and then even the BDC space where the loans are highly uh, private and non-traded. 
there's always an exception to every rule, but almost every closing fund is uh, marked with active management. There's a few sprout funds that don't. But the illiquid and the active management is in, you know, tradable in the market. And I find that that connection between the market price and the net asset value is not arm's length or tight as it usually is for the ETF structure. And I'm a William Mary alum, I'm a psych major, so I'm data driven, but I do hopefully talk about it in a, in, a, in a useful way. But I love the history of closed end funds, 1893, the first closed end fund, and then in um, 1906 was the first levered closed end fund. Um, of course, there were a lot more closed end funds before the 29 crash, and only a, a handful survived because they weren't levered or had some cash on their balance sheet and could you know, buy things up at that time. If you really think about them, you have the net asset value like any open-end fund structure, open-end regular mutual fund or ETF. But that movement of d market price, which if, you're a, if you were in London today and you're a by unit trust, their version of our closed-end funds, you would look at the U.S. retail-driven market and go, what the heck is going on there? It's so different. And we'll talk about that in some later slides. But that, that movement of market price around, above, below, both at the fund sponsor and sector level, really is, and at our industry conferences, we go, is it a bug or a feature, right? Because if you buy at a wide up discount and there's a discount narrowing event, it's alpha. If you buy at a discount stabilized price and then you have a discount blowout, it is negative alpha. And there's more ability to lever other fund structures, but originally they ha were off could have a preferred share class as a leverage, the original form of leverage for the neighborhood of funds. Now there's a lot more diverse leverage, especially since the financial crisis and even through COVID, and how they can gross their um, assets for the benefit of generally in the U.S. income-focused um, tools. And I'm pushing forward. Did I hit a button wrong? All right. Maybe somebody hit a page down or. All right. Don't know why the clicker is not working. All right. So this is the universe of funds that we have. And I keep remembering I'm loud, but there is a video audience as well, potentially. Just to let you know the areas that you can have exposure through this, this structure the number of funds, the amount of net assets and gross assets. These slides I've PDF'd and sent to the CFA Society. They can be sent to anyone after I approve them because I'm our chief compliance officer as well. The good and bad and ugly. It's interesting. Doesn't like. Well, this is just the asset managers in the space, just so you have a sense of who brings product to market, left side traditional close-end funds, right side BDCs. And a Discounts. So one reason why I was happy to take this speaking opportunity is discounts are relatively wide historically, which tends to bring crossover and relatively tactical investors to the space that want exposure to the NAVs, but are seeking to sift through opportunities with the wide discounts. This is considered wide dispersion of different sectors, some trading lighter, but many trading very, very wide. We can slide, please. This is a 25-year discount chart for the universe of funds. It is not the bottom, but the last I checked, we're not in a tech bubble blow up, a great global financial crisis, and we're actually at relatively wide discounts versus the COVID pullback. There's some logical reasons here. Two-thirds of the funds are credit funds. And if you hadn't noticed, the last two years, not every fund, but many funds had issues like their average cost of leverage was more expensive than their average cost of underlying yield for their portfolio, making leverage for the first time for more than a glitch, truly not additive at a sector level, not idiosyncratic exposure from just manager decisions. That created a lot of dividend reductions and a lot of NAV negative performance and some terrible results for investors. And when there's blood in the streets, as John Templeton always liked to say, is when you should be investing. All right, next slide, please. Thank God there's no animation on the slides, or he'd be uh, uh, working hard for his lunch. This is the monthly data, month end discount data for the universe. It is only 6% wider at, at month end than it was uh, at the end of the year. Discounts are slightly tighter now, but not dramatically. 
This slide I bring up because people look at the yields for funds, and funds can have fake yields. That could be a separate conversation about distribution policies and real and fake in the U.S. close of a market. But if you think about a discounted market price to NAV, and generally funds that are levered, you know, 25% for equity funds, 30 to 40 for credit funds, 50 to 60 for BDCs, you get a lot of gross exposure at a lower entry point. And if you do that right, with the right tailwinds and with thesis, it's a great way to get more guts per market dollar, whether you're a hedge fund, a family office, or a retired investor. This slide simply to show you the difference in the NAV volatility for the groups versus market price, and then a one year versus a 10 year. There can be extreme volatility in pockets, and generally the net asset value volatility is lower. And when Dan and I, my co-portfolio manager, talk about what we love, we love stable NAVs and volatile discounts, because if you can call the sector right and tap into that, that is generally better alpha. Leverage, a big part of most funds, especially the credit funds, most credit funds have leverage, sometimes only five to 10%, but it's part of the close-in fund in the US market story. This gives you a sense of where there's leverage and the style. We have tons of data here. If you think about our data business, tremendously granular asset allocation, leverage, expense ratio, and we do things like we, we QA net asset values every morning. If you can believe it, there are days where over half of the net asset values at Morningstar are wrong, not every day, sometimes by over 50 basis points, and that's useful if you're a trader in this space. Next slide. I wanted to cover this slide, but I sense we're probably running a little behind, but this is looking at the current discounts and the current indicated yields and going back in time and showing you how they're different. I am gonna cover BDCs and munis because they're good, very different structures. Munis are 12.4 discount, that's the bottom here. Previous quarter, only 4% lighter. But for a year ago, they've widened 4.5%. And from the peak of kind of close-end fund, pre-inflation duration mania, they were above par, November 8th, 2021. They're at the level at year end, they were March 23rd, the day the markets bottomed during COVID is the current muni bond pricing to NAV. And I told you there's real reasons for that pain, but it's still a very wide entry point. And then BDCs, they're trading a little bit lighter, um, narrower than where they were. But again, I mean, five points lower uh, than where they were pre-COVID and eight and a half points where they were pre-inflation issues. Benefit for BDCs is they were up like 27% last year for the index and the dividends are up about 18% on a three-year basis. And for some reasons, people like positive performance and dividend growth, I have no idea why. Next slide, please. This shows you dividend changes. I like to tell people that look at closing funds, I, this room should appreciate it. These are not bonds, they're actually equities. Now, we, there's guts, that can be bonds. But the policies are set by the board, they can be rational, they can be irrational. And so they change sometimes very often or sometimes never. I mean, we see funds that should change their dividend policy by logical external reviews, and they don't. They either hope to fuel it with NAB performance or erode their capital, or if they trade well, can do a rights offering or, or ATMs or other ways to rebuild their capital to pay the shareholders. It is not a common logical process. It's very sector and fund sponsor driven. Next slide, please. When you think about the movement of market prices, and these are large baskets, these are the munis and the taxable universal funds, over 100 funds in each bucket, the quarterly correlation between, the rolling previous correlation between the NAV and the market price, you would think over long periods of time that the market price would follow the NAV. It does, but because of the emotional and highly retail-centric component, you get these short peaks and short valleys of where the NAV is driving market price and where the NAV is not driving market price. And if you try to think of the elasticity of this process between discounts and correlations of NAV and market price and the price versus its benchmark with anchoring of the net asset value, if you, if you don't love the fact these things are diversified, yes, there's fees there, they're not perfect, but this is the data that should, I would argue, hopefully excite you. IPOs. Uh, there's been a drought because we had some large IPOs timed poorly, which has happened before. 
Discounts are very wide. The current structure for US IPOs is the manager generally does a 12-year term where the net asset value can be purchased for any shareholder after 12 years, and the manager pays the generally 4 to 5% load that the syndicate desks get paid to create the fund. Used to be investors paid that load. Now it's the advisors. The challenge is with the growth of activism recently, and not just you know, pro-structure, long-term partnership activism, but more you know, killing funds, taking the contract, 50% tenders at NAV activism, there's been a drought. And that drought is common, but it's longer than usual for this stage in the cycle. And this is why. These are the last three years of IPOs. If you look at them, think, you know, BIGZ, probably the one that Boaz Weinstein has the biggest problem with, it's 36% of its IPO price. It paid out yield, too much yield. They cut the dividend, but not enough. But it's still trading at 19 discount, even with an activist hungry after the investments. Now, to be fair, it's kind of a covered call version of an, you know, Kathy Wood's ARC fund poorly executed IPO because they didn't know the future. But there's some very painful IPO experiences here and still some very large discounts. If you ran these funds' discounts versus their peer group averages, they're running roughly 4 to 5% wider than their perpetual cousins. And yet, there's an argument. A lot of new capital came into the structure that wasn't used to closing funds. They were told pervasive discounts wouldn't be a problem because of the term structure and the manager would pay the load, and then the market gave them a different outcome. And looking even two years out for the, the term funds closing out in 27, previous structure, Blackstone has a couple, they're still trading wide discounts, even with guaranteed NAV, essentially guaranteed NAV, in under 24 months. Next slide, please. This is a general trend of institutional ownership. The one that to me is the most impressive, I remember it was at a Kaplan conference in New York, pre-COVID, so either 18 or 19, talking to one of our contacts at Saba. We'd been selling them data for about a decade. They weren't always an activist investor. And literally at the conference, I won't use his name, said, oh, we don't buy muni close-end funds. But literally that day, the first 13D hit for muni close-end funds. They were just dabbling. The institutional trend was here about 6% 10 years ago. It's getting close you know, to getting close to 25%, actually over 25% now, almost 30%. Because, remember, very easy to understand guts, very cheap discounts, and historically these funds trade generally well. Next slide. Proxy battles, and again, these are, these are slides put together at the ICI conference, so they're not as fresh as ours, um, but I wanted to cover some historical trends here, and the panel did it well. The 24 numbers were, as of October, what they expected for this year. So those numbers will be higher at some, at some level. Proxy battles are common. But if you do the next slide, here's where, and again, there's two types of activists, the way I would classify them. I always get questions how we classify activists versus activist followers. The simple way would be, who does public proxy campaigns that involves Twitter or open letters? and that actually can get results. Because there are some firms in the space that will do open things, but will, I would argue never spend a dollar on a lawyer or a proxy campaign. Then you have more in the Richmond's home to 1607 Capital, that maybe someone in the room from there, I have no idea. But yeah, so the, I know the firm well. I don't know any of your private conversations, but I know that Aberdeen brings board, board members to Richmond because they're a sponsor that cares about their shareholders. They'll grab lunch with me as well. They tend to do pro-structure, long-term ways for everyone to win. I would argue that activism, while well, does narrow discounts, the activists are often doing what's best for their clients. Well, that's their job. That's fine. They often will do things that only benefit their clients and often are short-term and can kill funds. And Saab has taken two funds, and I'd argue that, well, they're not a bad asset manager, they're not closing the discount and you know, Bulldog, who fills a friend, we disagree on some things because we're allowed to, easier than politics to be in the closing fund sometimes. Um, SPE, the fund he took over years ago, trades at a wide discount. And so th it's interesting to see the capital that's been invested from these players. Historically, you know, Bryce Doty at sits, pretty aggressive, but kind of sits between uh, the process. 
Carpus and Bulldog and Sab are generally the more aggressive investors in the space. Ones that, by the way, at the ICI conference, they're all just worried about Saba because Bulldog is under 200 million. Saba is close to 4 billion US right now. They've raised, as you'll see later, 800 million in new filings this year. All right, next slide. The quarterly movement from these larger focused either followers or activist investors showing you where they're doing their 13s, their Ds, their Gs, their Fs in the sectors where they're looking to move around. Next slide. So as I said, 10 years ago, we just sold data to a guy that picked up a bunch of cheap bond funds because he made a few bucks on some trade back in London. And they started to realize to get out of it would be more complicated than simply waiting for rotation or the market to do the work themselves. So they are now becoming the leading and most focused by dollars and by effort. And again, I've been in the room and Bulldog was killing a fund. You know, he's got the one proxy solicitor. You know, he, I mean, Phil, I mean, Phil feels like we only have $180 million. We can't afford your data yet. I'm like, okay, Phil, but Phil's cheap as crap. You don't know him. Um, Saba really focused on doing U.S. battle in a, in a lot of ways. If you have a question, if I need to clarify, please ask. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question. What do you mean by killing the phone? So, great question. So, I guess it, it, we have to adjust it from the future. Usually, it can be open-ending, which kills the structure. You can liquidate, which kills the, the fund. Um, it can convert to an ETF open-end fund. Now, there's a slide later, but there's different ways. You basically, you're, you're either killing the close-end fundedness of the fund, making it an open-end structure. You're liquidating, giving cash to shareholders. Um, or, you know, you could be converting it. More recently, the last two funds he really attacked, he took control of and now runs two funds. He took a global income fund, which was kind of boring, but one of John Templeton's favorite and Mark Mobius's GIM is now SABA. And who knows what the philosophy will be. They had taken, a, I believe, a Voya fund, and it's now BRW. Is that right, BRW? Yeah, and um, you know, basically, one thing neat about BRW is you get exposure to London funds in a U.S. wrapper, not easy to find for a retail investor. So it's killing the close of fundness or just killing the fund. You know, if, it's a, if there's a 20 discount and you close a discount, then everyone makes 20%. Then the argument is, is the fund actually a good fund or a bad fund? Is it useful for investors? And it's interesting, you know, the ICI is these, the entity that supports all funds, you know, I was at the uh, ICI conference with Hertzfeld and City of London and Bramshill, and I think someone from 607 was there, but a bunch of us, the, the two panels actually suggested lobbying the New York Stock Exchange to end the requirement for annual meetings to avoid activism. And, the ch and I was like, and, they, and we're in the room. <laughs> you know, it was like a closed door meeting. This isn't, it's not politics, but it's definitely the lawyers are trying to protect their clients. It's not the right outcome, but there's, there's some tools that activists use there a little bit. I'd say both sides do things that maybe, if you look at the rules and tension of, the, of the, what they're allowed to do, like when, when they try to stop people voting over 10% of their shares, they lost in court because that breaches the 40 Act. I mean, you should, I mean, I don't like some funds dying, but you should vote the shares you own. That's the nature of a publicly listed anything. You know, you shouldn't have protection uh, for the funds. But, well, that's their ETF of closing funds, but they have just shy of a four billion in U.S. exposure and close to a billion of U.K. exposure currently. We don't follow U.K. as well, but we hear about it because there's a lot of usually like uh, uh, 607 and other larger firms often buy the different structures. Our clients are retail, and we custody at Schwab, and we can't even buy you know any of those closing funds if we wanted to without growing a, a, a relationship. And most of our clients are there for the income, not for access to U.K. funds so far, at least. Next slide, but good, good question. There will be more about that. The major driver, and this is also from the ICI, is that the bulk of public companies are institutionally held. The bulk of funds are retail held, and I double-checked our data last night. Funds is any fund. Close on funds, depends on your measurement, it's closer to 80. It's been that way for the bulk of my 25, 24 years. Close to 80% is retail owned, which I also would include any advisor that buys on the IPO and holds a fund more than five years is basically retail. It's not a tactical, thoughtful, we own it because we want to and we can change our mind, uh, ownership of closing funds. I just talked to a guy that retired in 99, and for the first time since 99, he sold a bunch of mini bond funds because they finally went below cost basis. And he retired from the, from the syndicate desk at a large firm in, in about 10 years ago. Next slide. But that makeup, 
And then the, the voting, it is so hard to get retail investors to vote. I mean, you own 10,000 shares of something, which is a lot to retail. It's not really a lot of shares. To collect those votes is a constant struggle for even good funds with good success. Trying to even get the annual meeting done can be very, very hard in the sector, which the, again, I'll say the good and the bad. The good news is when you do a tender or any rights offering or other event, you tend to get twice, it's very hairy, of what's offered because so many retail just ignore everything. Either they forget that they owned it or they don't check their mail or their email and they don't focus on it or want to vote it. Even met a guy that's selling proxy votes. Uh, he'll buy your proxy votes not for contested campaign to give retail investors additional cash flow, especially in closing funds. Um, we met him through FinCon and he attended our conference last November. But the, the retail lack of voting is a heavy driver for these outcomes. Next slide, please. So this, what can happen, so this slide I came was presenting two fund sponsors, but it really, I, I kind of like their, the, the way they flavor it. What can you do to reduce discounts? Because remember, activism in closing funds isn't, I don't like the way they're building airplanes or their strategy for this new product. It's, there's a wide discount, we want to make extra money, let's do something about it. That's the general activism footing, or even institutional footing, which you can ride the coattails on. Tender offers, probably the most common, non-totally killing. The challenge is, yes, we tender everything we can. It's extra money, and we don't say no to that. We often will rebuy back in later at a similar discount to before. It does not fix discounts, but it does tend to at least give you a standstill agreement if you work hard. Like there's a bunch of Franklin Templeton funds doing very aggressive 50% tenders. Doesn't mean you'll get all your shares, but you'll get you actually get less because that's such a big tender, it will get more attention than a 20% tender. You probably could get almost as many shares in a 20% tender as 50 because of the way it will come out. But it means they have a standstill agreement with Saba, so they live to fight another day. And that's become the nature of what's going on, and we'll have to see what Nuveen and others do. But the exposures are, I mean, there are like 60 funds where Saba owns over 5% of the stock, and I think 37, they own over 10%. And this is as of the fourth quarter, not even as of... Again, the other, I just pulled our fresh 13 file export for D's this year to date. It's a lot. You can convert a perpetual fund to a termed, but we find it takes a long time for that to narrow the discount because it will happen, but people don't give it the value. Like you might say a 12 discount, three years, it's going to liquidate at NAV. If you want to be in the sector, you trust the manager to a certain degree, and you don't care about the dividend, you have that additional return, but it may take a long, it's not, Straight. Never, closing ones are never a straight line. I mean, probably some are, but really not as a group or historically. And so there's extra tailwinds, as we call them in our work, uh, to do that. You can convert to the other structures we talked about earlier that has uh, no market price listing. Um, you can try to increase trading volume or even just do some more marketing. Uh, the nonprofit, we don't tell everyone's story. We pick funds that we like and try to tell their story to hopefully improve them. But it also gives me a chance to chat with the fund sponsor and their board about things I would do if I were in their room uh, making decisions for the funds. Um, and again, there's pros and cons to this, but I would argue is if we didn't have any activism, if the fund sponsors won, the discounts would be worse. There were so many 20 discounts before activism picked up again in the 90s. I wasn't working, but my dad did this job for 50 years, and he actually got on the board of a closing fund through activism. His best friend bought a third of the stock of a venture equity closing fund that got broken in the 70s, and that's why we even do this work. So there's different strategies. The nice thing is they, they, they work out, usually if you do enough of them, like most bets, the same trend, but there's definitely, it's not a determined guaranteed outcome. Next slide, please. These are those 13 filings just year to date for Saba. Um, the light blue is the average. The, for these filings, they own 5.6% on average. You can see a bunch of double digits. And the, um, the, uh, the 1.8 billion in exposure total with an 800 million increase just year to date in the shares and the dollar values that they own in a roughly flat, I mean, it's only two weeks, but it's not like we're up 20% this year and that's what's increasing the value. So these are where they're, again, just in the last two weeks, they're reducing their exposure to the, um, where is it? The the uh, CXH and CMU because they kind of got the outcome they wanted. And HIE is technically negative, but 
flat. And that one actually um, liquidates end of this year, I believe. So discount's pretty tight. Yes. Please. Uh, one, with respect to these retail books, you mentioned oftentimes don't get voted. Uh, how are they treated? Is there negative consent language? What happens to those non voted shares? And well, you have to get quorum. Or you have to, or they have to move annual meeting, you know, right? You know, even simple things like there's a closing fund XFLT. It's a CLO fund. Um, Octagon's a manager. Daily Nav trades generally above par. They are trying to remove their term structure because they've proven to trade well. And I'm not saying, but it's not like they're a terrible fund trying to remove their term structure. It's decent behavior, and they just are having trouble getting the votes. Um, you know, they're doing another round of proxy calls to get the votes, and so it's just it's it's. You know, I would say. So a non-participant. Yeah, yeah, and then things like UITs often do mirror voting, which again you can argue benefits activists or does. It really depends on. It, there's times that they wish they had more flexibility to decide what to do, um, but yeah, even the UIT, yes, you know, so investment trusts, which are passively held, actively created, um, often buy lots of closing funds because it's, it's historically a very good delivery system for FAs. What are the voting thresholds for quorum and capacity? Uh, it can vary, and so um, I, I, I don't have the bright line answer for you. Um, that is usually the question for my friends at Skadden or KNL Gates, who actually spend more time defending these funds. Um, I'd have to look that up for you. I don't have it right in front of me. Does anyone here know? Okay. Can, can you just talk a little bit about the underlying assets? I've heard, I've heard you talk quite a bit about discounts and yeah. kind of the structures of the funds, but I'm kind of thinking about the underlying assets. To what extent are you looking, or is there clarity into what the underlying assets are? Yeah, so like any fund, they're required to do semi-annual updates, and so that's the most, that's the minimum required. Um, there are sponsors that are active in the primary and that put more dollars into the investor relations support that will update fact cards monthly, but now it's usually quarterly, at least give you top 10 sector exposure. You know, the net asset value is calculated daily for almost every regular traditional closing fund. Um, and so I'd say, you know, when we started to grow our data business, you know, you can uh, collect wrapper data, so that's all you know, the expense ratio, the leverage, all the fundness stuff of the fund, and then there's the guts. And so I'd say the best you can do is hope there's a, there's a quarterly fact card. But if you track the nav, if you're into the space and have resources, you track the nav, you estimate the nav. When the nav is not moving like you suspect, then you know something's happening, and you're trying to reverse engineer whether it's because they're tilting into from high yield into senior loan or they're going from you know value to growth. I mean there's different funds. But just like there's not daily transparency of the holdings, I'd argue it wouldn't really change anything if they offered that. Um, you know, there's not so much secret sauce in these funds or I'd you know, there's so many products of things that are daily active ETFs that are daily transparent, you know, people aren't just People still buying the product. So when you make an investment into one of these funds, are you making that investment is purely on a, it doesn't sound like it's on a fundamental basis. Well, so, so. Assets, so. It is, so we, we, we at our firm, so I'll take a step back. I was trying to do more industry perspective. We have asset allocation decisions. So we lower duration exposure in the summer of 21, like I hopefully most of you guys did, if it made sense. Um, and we were overweight senior loans and BDCs because we were thoughtful on the, fixed leverage, variable assets, yet diversified. We tend to own 40 positions for clients, you know, maybe four to six BDCs, could add an additional two to six interval funds if the volatility, because uh, those are less vol. but yeah, definitely asset allocation. Like we're often overweight sectors we like, you know, we, last year we were overweight MLPs, BDCs, senior loans, and REIT real assets, and that last one's the only one that still kind of nicked us a little bit. It, yet it was up 10% last year, which was 5% less than the average closing fund. The average closing fund was up 15% last year, and that's half credit exposure. And that's, you know, munis are the largest bucket of traditional funds, and even preferred equity had another terrible results during that time period. So it definitely is asset allocation. I kind of, because you're CFA holders mostly, or at least you come to lunches like this, could, you know, NAV analysis is crucial for the asset allocation, but really it's the closing fundedness, the things that happen naturally over time or what institutional investors can do, that is the differentiator. Because you can see you're stuck in a 20 discount. And there are funds at a 20 discount that I'd argue will bounce between 22 and 18 until something changes. And that's not actually a cheap discount. It's a natural discount, either because it's a terrible asset manager that people hate, or it's a product that's just not 
well received or the nav is considered less than granularly correct on a, on a regular basis. But yeah, definitely at our firm, if you hire us as a separate account, you know, it's, it's nav analysis, which is the sector, discount analysis, and then dividend analysis, because you'll find dividend cuts less than expected will we'll narrow discounts, but you can't ignore the fact that dividend cuts, if you're not thoughtful about them and react to them, in, you know, the same day they happen or as soon as you learn about them can be very useful. It's kind of like when, an op, when a BDC does a secondary and goes from a 15 premium down to a 10. You know, people that bought it two days ago are frustrated, but if you like the asset manager and the structure, it's a great time to get in because you just got an entry point that's useful. And any secondary over NAV is accretive to NAV, not hurtful to NAV. Next slide. And I love questions, but I do want to... This is a slide that shows those conversions of the industry since 2006 when we kind of turned on our, our, our noticing them. And it's not, I mean, there's big years and small years. And I'd say the major difference is we've had three closing funds change managers to activist investors as their fund sponsor that is not really tracked in this data. But these are all the leaving the closing fund world, either open end, liquidate, or converted. Next slide. So I want to talk about munis. Again, this, you should understand munis probably better than I do. But right now, this is a well-known ETF, but lower duration than most closing funds. This is if you just took the guts, we average for the sector, the leverage of NAV yield. That's the average expected yield the manager has to hit to fuel the dividend policy. You add leverage, it goes to 426. You add a discount, it goes to 485. What I think drives this market being so retail-centric, and yet institutional investors buy it too, obviously, an eight and change tax equivalent yield for those with a lot of income and a lot of wealth. That's the backbone of why people own munis. And then if they have, like the guy, he worked at a syndicate desk. He finally sold his muni bond funds after like 25 years because he didn't want to pay capital gains on them. Muni bond investors abhor taxes. So they're stickier for the retail side. Next slide. This is that discount chart, but just for munis. If you thought the other one looked, Rick, this is only a 1% cheaper month end than year end. We are wider than 08 at year end. I gave you the story. High leverage cost because the yield curve takes a while for the bonds to raise their coupon levels to surpass that in the market. Next slide. Oh, sure, please. So have any of the muni funds, I'm not very familiar with space, but do have any been like more sophisticated turned out their debt structure? Like Yeah, the leverage, I'd say one beautiful thing, both through, after 2008, the leverage got much more diverse. Um, you could say funds, uh, firms like BlackRock and Nuveen got rid of their auction rate preferreds because of the headline risk. PIMCO kept it. And so that's actually cheaper leverage if you don't mind dealing with the market disliking the leverage you picked, but way the leverage. The leverage is so much more diverse, and we have seen leverage come down this year, because not as much as you could argue. Like Bryce Doty on SIT was on our podcast talking about how these funds should be bringing the leverage down. Every leverage that's not added to income should be gone. That would be probably, it's, it's tough. You're doing what's best for the funds, economics, but also you're trying to balance the expectations of shareholders. Uh, you know, But diverse leverage is definitely the answer. But I guess my question is, like, in 2020, did anyone take, like, 10-year debt out? Yeah, we, we saw leverage get a lot more fixed and a lot more um, tactical around those events. And then is there an opportunity where that's not marked to market, so the NFE discount's actually more than it? Does that make sense? The question makes sense. We're like, in the enterprise value of company, the debt's not ever adjusted. So you can look at, like, AV InBev and potentially... Yeah, I mean, so the... It's an asset. There's different. There's retail sold debt. There's also institutional sold debt. It's different for taxable versus tax-free um, funds. Uh, all I can say is, you know, Nuveen, one of the largest creators of these funds, and puts a lot of resources educating everyone. Has you know, like Nate Jones on their team is a guy I call to talk to an hour about leverage and closing funds, and then we get a 10-minute version of that on a podcast to try to explain the diversified options of the leverage. But the types of leverage they have. Some is markable, some's not. I mean, there's, there's revolvers as well as, you know, preferred stock. You know, there's institutional placements. It's, there's so much debt. Like when we have a slide tomorrow and others, there's just so much types of debt. It's not overwhelming, but it's not one thing. It's many things. But great question. Next slide, please. No. These are just wide discounts, one fund per asset manager. This is not a recommendation. I think you can appreciate that. This is just showing you if you had a 10% allocation of munis, 
14 and change discount. It's wider than normal. I'm not, oh, I thought I heard a question. The data is different. Just look at the one year, three year NAV total return. And these are all baskets of muni. So there's different decisions on leverage and sector, you know, different pieces of the muni market. A lot of people will bucket munis as one thing, like they would MUB or a longer durated duration product. But there is so much difference in these funds. Look at the duration category. I mean, the crazy thing the last two years, the two year weekly NAV beta is above the SP 500 because it was a crazy year for credit. And these are levered credit. The leverage right now is 36.5% uh, on average. And we did notice that leverage came down you know, during 2020. There were funds with our, our, our leverage data is very simple. Notional value of leverage, current net assets. Every day our leverage number moves. Morningstar data and Bloomberg data does not do that. And we saw funds getting close to the general 50% RIC breaching status. If you breach your RIC status as a closed end fund, you just can't pay a dividend. But if you're retail owned, that is like one of the worst things you can offer your shareholders. Pimco happened in 08, they couldn't pay a November dividend on one fund. They paid it in December, but it took them a long time to kind of recover from that from a marketing perspective. Next slide. This shows you like the basket together and kind of what you're getting. When I talk about what you can put your thumb on versus the exposure, for the 15 discount I'm rounding here and the four and a quarter yield and the 36% leverage, every dollar is exposed to a dollar 60 of manager assets. So for a million dollar allocation, it's one six of manager assets. You can't sell that, but that's what you're running on. And so if you, that's the benefit of buying these things. And the expense ratio for munis is like the lowest, you know, 70 basis points, which is not free, but I don't, and the leverage cost averaging right now 2.42 for this basket. And that's a blended cost of all leverage types that they have. But that's just one of the ways we look at a portfolio of funds uh, to make decisions in allocation level and then position. Next slide, please. This is the two-year weekly NAV analysis of that same basket. And again, I just picked the widest discounts for each fund sponsor. That was my, my filter. 80s, but the market prices are 96, 97, 98, 99 because they, sh so the NAVs. The NAVs are tracking the same, but the wrappers move differently. And that's where it's not just sifting by discounts or yield, but you're doing the work of the levers, the expense ratio. Like when, when, when um, Amundi launched their MIO fund, and they suddenly were doing 10% worse than their peer group average in a down market, I call what contacts I'm like, you've got to communicate the why, because if you don't, the answer is you're terrible. They did a, web, a webinar, it wasn't very good. They didn't cover, the compliance didn't let them go deep enough into the why, unfortunately. And they've just been plagued, and I'd argue there's a good chance they'll lose the fund because they just had terrible experience, performance, and they haven't gotten in front of it. And I'm like, it's not the leverage, it's not the duration. It's not, I mean, I looked at all the data we collect, it's not the high level data. There's something you did, entry point, sector decision. It was a more focused portfolio, only had 50 holdings at the start. And then maybe just picked the wrong 50, which can happen. But this just shows you the differences in market price movements last two years for a basket of basically the same thing. Next slide. Here's where we basically transition to BDCs if there's time, let's do a time check. I don't think we do. I don't want to keep you guys over. I have some slides on BDCs. They're a wonderful structure. But the liquidity of mini bond funds, 1.6 million per day on average, seven for BDCs. And there are BDCs, the index averages $10 million a day. There are good credit managers. The fee structures are higher, but the holdings are private. If you do your work on wrapper data, due diligence, they're liquid exposures. They tend to trade well if they're good. I just argue, the average, people look at the expense ratio like an open-end fund, it's 10%. You do a gross non-leverage expense ratio for the better funds, it's two in low change. A couple are one in high change. So the fees are higher, because the guts are private, but I, I'd hope to get to it. I wanted to cover activism, because it's probably the easiest, most common, while giving you, hopefully, perspective on the wrapper, the universe of funds. But I would say, there's some slides here, I, take a look and maybe they'll pique your interest. You can always, Give me a call, I'm happy to chat further, but I don't want to hold you over one because I know we're all busy. Any other additional questions? And I'll stick around for a while if you want to chat one-on-one. -on -one. With these level of discounts and the amount of private capital that you have that's sloshing around with there, why is there not more activism? 
activism is expensive. You have to hire lawyers and proxy firms, you know, and I'd say when I think about, so, you know, what Boaz has done on Twitter, I mean, I won't say it's new, it's not, it's new for closing funds. Closing funds are such a sleepy pocket of the market. Um, I mean, just to see the crossover interest for people attending our stuff and reaching out, it's um, people that have never considered closing funds before. And because they're, they're, he's good at press. Okay, his budget, he spends money. Um, so I, I would say the challenge is people always worry that the holdings are generally six months for full allocation. You know, you can have the closing funds by nature are more volatile than other structures. The volatility is not the leverage. That's a little bit increased volatility for the NAV. But a lot of people just dislike it. But if you're used to buying operating companies or individual bonds, I think these, these things, they're, there's no investments perfect. But you just roll up your sleeves. And again, another objection is liquidity. Um, and just, we're, you know, we're not a huge firm, but talk to the billion dollar players and higher. They can move. There's traders in the space. There's numerous. Uh, one that we know the best is a firm called Walkbeth. Um, it's an old activist investor that's now a trader, and they gave him a good tech budget. So balance of Rolodex and tech. Not perfect, but you can move a lot more shares efficiently and prove it than you might. If you look at a closing fund and go, oh, I can never buy enough of that to make, meet my objective, give me a call or connect to you with, uh, with Mark or the other folks in the space. But people matching orders. Like we, we inherited a large position of source capital, and we're trying to move way too much and I had to do it the old fashioned way because I couldn't find it. They wanted, the buyer was $1.50 for, for 50,000 shares. It was crazy. Um, and we just had to work it the old fashioned way slowly and uh, hope the market was with us not against us. And thankfully it was in the last month so it was with us. A good question. Yes, sir. And just any predictions on how you see uh, these activist campaigns playing out sort of longer term, particularly for the class of funds that mostly own public securities, easy to value. Yeah. You arbitrage. You, know, you look at the trends in the courts, right? They, the fund companies tend to be losing, um, yep. you know, for the most part. Like, where do you see this in five years, ultimately? I mean, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. You look at I me, mean, I guess you're speaking like, you know, General American and Adams Express are kind of like the most boring, but the pre-29 crash funds. Um, you know, I, I would argue that, uh, you know, when when Adams Press got their first 13 filing from Saba, Phil Goldstein, had our, we had an activism panel uh, in November, which is, I think, as of now, a free replay on the ACO website. He basically said uh, the expense ratio of Adams Express is like 60 basis points. It's, it's, it's basically a spy proxy with some tilts, but you're not going to argue excessive fees. You know, it's, le it's a lower fee structure than the average muni I just showed you. Um, discounts pervasive. You know, trades 12 to 18 like it's Tuesday. Um, could narrow if they, the board, you know, one of our clients used to be the largest owner of it. My dad's former partner who's passed away six years ago. I met with a previous PM and I was like, just change your dividend policy. You're not, you know, like EOS, which is a monthly tax optimized Eaton Vance product. And you're not get the same benefit of Eaton Vance wholesalers, but at least the dividend policy at Adams Express is ridiculous. It either shows too small or too big on anything besides our system. And so is it the right use of the wrapper? Probably not today, but it's not, you know, I'd say it's got a club on its steering wheel. You could steal it if you wanted to. If I was attacking a U.S. equity fund, it wouldn't be ADX personally. Um, but I think those funds need to find ways to use their wrapper better. I mean, I'd say I talked to Mark Stokel maybe six years ago. He was just the cost to add a le leverage facility. And this is when rates were low. He didn't like that cost to the expense ratio even before they tapped into it. That was his instinct. I mean, he was a credit manager before. If he would know him. But you know, he was not a long-only U.S. equity guy before. Um, you, know, you really should tap into private, illiquid stuff because that's the benefit of the fixed capital structure is to not worry about daily redemptions, to go in markets that are illiquid. You know, like senior loan funds and the open and fund wrapper, to me, are risky as heck. Um, but only if things break, and they haven't broken yet. It's a great sector, but much more durable in a closing fund. I mean... The, the managers there they love it when they uh, when the BKLN has to be a force redeemer of something. Yeah, I, mean, I guess more generally, do you see like the active ETF wrapper being probably better for a lot of these products that are? Yeah, so it, it's yeah. my first month in the business was February of twenty one. I joined in January, but full first full month went to the stock exchange. There was still some paper on the floor. And we, the Closing Fund Association tried to see if we could convert closing funds to exchange-listed funds, but, but ETFs were gaining some traction. 
What I'd argue is interval funds and the active ETFs are such bookends of structures for a fund sponsor. Like you really can have the most private stuff on one and the most liquid on the other. And it really is going to force closing funds to find their proper footing. And it's probably going to be a little painful because there's been such growth in interval funds and tender offer funds in that space. And there's such growth in active ETFs. You know, m my entire career and most of my dad's 50 years, people thought closing funds are going to be killed by ETFs since, you know, since 19... Was it 93 when the, when the SPY came out, which is a modified UAT I learned last year. Um, so I just say it's going to create better product. And yeah, I mean, there's going to be some funds that can stick it out. I mean, I look at Kane Anderson. They were being pressed on by Saba. They went to all their institutional shareholders and they preemptively did positive things for all. And again, it, they could still be attacked, but you're, you're making it harder to win the public fight and maybe the court fight by preemptively doing that. You definitely want to do those things as a fund sponsor before you get the open letter, before you get the 13D. And if you do, Angel Oak has one closing fund and one interval fund, and they saw, I can't remember if it was Matisse or somebody in their 13. They go, yeah, don't worry about Matisse. They're not going to, Eric, there's a great guy, but they're not going to spend a dollar on fighting you. They're doing an open letter. Um, and again, and it's interesting, fund sponsors will often hear, so one of the board members now at Aberdeen used to be at um, Mac Macquarie. You know, said, Macquarie, put your head in the sand, ignore the investors, just do your job, manage the nav, and just see what happens. Well, now Aberdeen owns their funds, and Aberdeen, again, I'm not in there, I'm not a large shareholder, but we're friends. They go out there and they talk to people. There was a merger of tons of country funds that I'm sure the 13 filers helped facilitate to make a newer multi-sector mandate. You know, we don't need an Israel fund and a Chile fund anymore. Um, so I think, yeah, it's going to clean up the industry a little bit. You know, but that will create opportunities to use the structure better, which to me the best use. They have the right structure. Too many interesting rappers out there to just the one's best. And credit funds are generally better for closing funds. You gotta do something interesting for a regular equity fund to be created today. I mean, I think the covered call funds were beautiful, the way they tax managed and softened the beta for equity investors so they could pair it with munis and be diversified. That was a beautiful creation back in two thousand four, five, six. A good question. Well, as they say, uh, there's more questions, but we have no more time. You know. uh, appreciate you listening to me this morning. I hope it was coherent and thoughtful and connected. I'll be better next time I tell people you know, with experience. But if you had heard me 12 years ago, it was not nearly as good. I was 30-something, not 40-something. <laughs>